good to have you guys here. Let's go ahead and stand as we come on in from the foyer 486. I want you guys to lift it up with us tonight. Faith is the victory. So as we take our hymnals, lift it up 486, and we'll do the first and the last. Faith is the victory. And count for this good day you've given to us, Lord. We just pray you'd bless uh, our song service, Lord. Bless the time we spend in preaching of the word. And we just thank you for all that's said and done. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. All right, well, let's turn over a couple pages to 493. This song is entitled, It Is Well With My Soul. Every day it is well, no matter what we go through. Our God still loves us. Great promise there. 493, all four verses. Sing it out with me tonight. It is well. When peace like a
Cornerstone. You may be seated at this time. Amen. Thank you. Good to see you tonight. Good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. All right. Well, uh, just a, a couple very quick things. I, I think you're probably up to date on most of the announcements. We made them a couple times this morning, but uh, remind you uh, of one thing that we didn't mention, and that is uh, this Tuesday night is our kindergarten graduation. Friday night was our high school graduation. Uh, Tuesday night is kindergarten graduation. And uh, in preparation for that, Mrs. Plew says she needs a few good men to clean the platform after the church service tonight. So if you can help for, it takes 10 or 15 minutes to get, get that done. If you can help after the church service, uh, then uh, that would be very, very helpful uh, to, to her uh, with that so that they can uh, have their program uh, this Tuesday night. So uh, just mark that down. Of course, remember Memorial Day weekend, we have a couple things. We do have Saturday saturation. Uh, even though it's a holiday, holiday weekend, uh, we can still leave things on the doors and uh, so forth about Bible school, promote uh, our Bible school. And then on Sunday, uh, we would have uh, 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 the normal morning service, pitch in dinner following the, the morning worship service, and then we come back for the afternoon service. So if you would uh, uh, plan on being part of that, I think that would be beneficial. And uh, we'll look forward to a great day. If you're going out of town, uh, then we'll pray for you on your travels. And you pray for us that we have a, a good service uh, at that time. All right. Then let us uh, at this time go ahead and receive our tithes and offerings and gifts to the Lord. Uh, as we look to the Lord uh, in prayer, I lost my deacon, so uh, I'll let uh, Brother Williams lead us in prayer. Stand. Thank you for that orchestra. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Well, let's look at another song as we stand 271, standing on the promises of God my Savior. 271, we'll do uh, the first and the last song. This one, I'm sorry, I had a brain. Well, here we go. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Oh 
wonderful singing. You may be seated. Right now, the two through five-year-olds are still leaving. We are thankful for them. Thank you, parents, also, for your patience. I know that they can be loud, but it's okay. They're in the Lord's house. It's a great place for them to be. So thank you also, church, for your patience with that as they are dismissing. Right now, we're going to have a special. Uh, Crystal, Melissa, and Christina will be singing Grace.
Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that very much. Well, we're blessed uh, tonight to have one of our missionaries with us, uh, Brother McNamara, uh, overseas and works uh, with men and women that are planting churches, uh, a little bit of everywhere, but uh, got uh, 50 some, how many? 52? 52 years. Uh, doing this type of work. We're thankful for men like him that are, who have been so faithful, part of our missions program as far as church planting. And uh, so tonight he's here. He's going to report to us, preach to us, and challenge us from God's word. Thank you, sir. It's always a challenge to ascend those stairs without falling flat on your face. Uh, such things do happen sometimes. Uh, fortunately, I haven't had to experience that too often, but uh, it's always a, a joy to come and be with you folks. It's a good thing to be here this weekend. This weekend was a, a good weekend. We finally got rid of our last grandson in school, and now he's an unemployed bum sponging off a of mom and dad. You know, I hope he turns out better than what he is right now. But uh, he, he thinks life is just as good as it can get right now. <laughs> All right, so good to be with you and uh, to come in back under better circumstances than what we were here the last couple of times, though Sean's doing well, and uh, we rejoice in that, and we're just uh, grateful for God's grace to us, and it's a joy to be with you tonight. All right, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I don't know if God has a trophy case in heaven or not, but he should. Because you and I, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we are the recipients of God's grace and we are trophies of God's grace. And that marvelous word, I, I heard it right there at the end of the song as they, they sang about the, the grace of God. Uh, that, that word uh, grace appears some 170 times in our Bible. You'll find it both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Uh, especially written by the Apostle Paul. Many of his writings are just uh, uh, filled with the grace of God. It's a, it's a marvelous, wonderful, uh, dynamic, uh, magnificent word. Uh, without the grace of God, none of us here tonight would know Jesus Christ as our, our personal Savior. If it wasn't for the grace of God, we wouldn't have the families that we have. We wouldn't have the things that we have. And, and we certainly would not uh, have the lives that God has given us here uh, because each one of us are the recipients of God's grace. God has been so good to us, and we don't deserve any of it. You know, the word grace comes from the, the Greek word charis, K-A-R-I-S, and it refers to, uh, to joy or to, uh, to pleasure, to delight, uh, to kindness, to favor. And it's been defined as God's unmerited favor. Uh, and sometimes you'll see it contrasted with God's mercy. You'll see uh, grace and mercy. And, and they're not the same thing. Uh, grace is God's unmerited favor, God giving us that which we do not deserve, whereas mercy is God withholding that which we do deserve. Uh, we deserve hell, we deserve punishment, we uh, deserve chastisement uh, for our sins, and God uh, withholds that from us when we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, somebody has said that, that grace, uh, grace is uh, uh, where there is grace, there is no debt, where there is grace, there is no obligation. Where there is grace, there is no merit. Sometimes you'll see the word grace written out as an acrostic. You know, an acrostic is where you have a word and each, each letter stands for a, a different word. And, and some people take that word grace and they'll, they'll spell it on a horizontal uh, level or on a vertical level uh, such as this. And it'll uh, stand for God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, the Apostle Paul knew something about the grace of God. He used the word more often than any other biblical writer. That's not surprising since he wrote half of the New Testament. Uh, but he was a man who knew something about the grace of God from personal experience. He had experienced uh, the grace of God on a level that few people ever experience. He had been uh, the lead persecutor of the church. Uh, he had imprisoned uh, multiple Christian people. He had uh, ransacked the church. He had made havoc. The Bible says he had made havoc of the church of Jesus Christ. And yet God in his grace reached down, confronted the uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, he put his faith in Christ and his life was transformed by the grace of God. And thereafter you find that he wrote about it again and again and again. 
And one of those places he wrote about it is here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you look at verses 9 and 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, notice what he says about the grace of God. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, there it is, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, there it is again, his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, there it is again, uh, the grace of God, which was with me. I am no apostle Paul. None of us are. We, we can't begin to approach uh, onto his level. Uh, and yet, each one of us are the recipients of the grace of God. Just like the apostle Paul was the recipient of the grace of God, we also are recipients of the grace of God. Paul did not have more of God's grace than what is available to you and me. Uh, that same grace is available to us uh, today. As a missionary, I, I feel somewhat like the Apostle Paul in that I, I, I see myself as the least of all the other missionaries. Uh, I, I see God using them and, and what God is doing in their lives. And uh, in comparison, I've done so little and have accomplished so little in comparison with them. Uh, and like the Apostle Paul, I, I feel that I am what I am by the grace of God. You know, God's grace can be manifested in your life as well as in my life. And, and God can take anybody, anybody, and he can pour his grace into their lives, and he can do marvelous things far beyond anything that they anticipated that they would ever be able to be used by God or ever to accomplish anything for God. God in his grace can do marvelous things. I think of the young people that graduated here on, on uh, I guess it was, let me see, Friday night. It's uh, and, and what God can do in their lives. Understand that a couple of the guys already are wanting to go into ministry and, and uh, are looking to God to direct them uh, concerning future ministry. But each and every one of them is a recipient of God's grace. And if they will let God lead them and direct them, no telling what God will do over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years through their lives. Souls will be saved, lives will be transformed, families will be touched, uh, churches may be planted. No telling what God may do in the life of uh, some of those young people there. You know, missions is all about the grace of God and God's program and God's plan for redeeming a lost mankind and bringing uh, a people out of the world onto himself. Uh, Paul was used of God in a marvelous way because of God's grace in his life. And as he went and ministered God's grace to other people, he saw God doing wonderful things. God can do and can use each one of us if we are willing to be available to him and to his grace. There are three things I want to share with you tonight. And the first one is simply this. Grace involves a threefold step in serving God. The grace of God involves a threefold step and a call to serve God. Uh, it all begins with the grace of God when God calls us unto himself for salvation. The uh, Bible says that we're saved by grace uh, and not by works, but by, by the grace of God. He calls us. For by grace are you saved through faith, that are not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Years ago, way back a long, long time before a lot of you were even in existence, the grace of God reached down to a little farm boy over New York State and touched his heart uh, to call him unto himself. It was by the grace of God as a 12-year-old that I came to know Jesus Christ as my, my Savior. I was, I'm not sure if I told the, the Hispanic church this this morning. I tried to tell the Hispanic church. Whether it came across or not, I'm not sure. But uh, I, I sought to tell them that uh, uh, as a, as a uh, boy grandpa on a farm in New York State, uh, I had two brothers. I had an older brother and a younger brother. And on Sunday afternoons, after uh, dinner was over, my two brothers, my older brother and my younger brother, they were allowed to go out of the house. They were uh, go play the rest of the afternoon. My mother wouldn't let me out of the house. I had to stay in the house, and I had to wash the, the dishes. I mean, here's a farm boy washing dishes all the time. And, and I had to be in the house washing dishes. My brothers never had to wash dishes, but I had to wash the dishes every Sunday afternoon. And then uh, instead of being allowed to go outdoors and play as I wanted to do, my mother uh, made me sit on a stool in the kitchen and I had to memorize next week's Sunday school verse. 
week after week after week. Sometimes I'd take an hour or two because I didn't want to do it. But I, I had to sit there until I had memorized next week's Sunday school verse. And then my mother, just to show you how mean she was, she would go and tell the Sunday school verse uh, teacher that I knew the verse and I had to stand up in front of the class and say the verse week after week after week. But you know, God used those verses in order to bring conviction of sin to my heart. And as a 12-year-old boy, one night, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I thank God that I had a mother that was mean enough to make me memorize those verses. So even though your kids don't want to memorize the verse, make them do it. Because God in his grace can use that in order to touch their hearts and, and to change their lives. By the way, that, that four-legged stool that was in my mother's kitchen, guess where it is today? It sits in my kitchen. Uh, it's, it's a reminder to me of the grace of God in my life. And I don't want to ever minimize that or, or forget that. But it's by the grace of God that we're called unto salvation, that we are called to receive Jesus Christ. And it's God's grace that he would forgive a, a sinner like me or a sinner like you and allow us to be a part of his family. But it's not only that we are saved by grace, but the Bible tells us that we are also called by grace. We are called by grace. Uh, as an unsaved man, the apostle Paul uh, had his own agenda. He had his own plans. But all that changed when he met the, the risen Savior on the road to Damascus and he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time in his life. He talked about that over in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1 and in, in verse 15 he says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. He called me by his grace. Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul, did not choose to be a missionary. He didn't choose to be a theologian. He didn't choose to be a writer of scripture. He didn't choose to do what he ended up doing. Rather, it was by the grace of God that God reached down, touched his life, called him, set him apart for a particular ministry that God had in mind for him to use, uh, to use him to, to accomplish. In Acts chapter nine and in verse 15, uh, God said unto Ananias, remember Ananias, the fellow in, in Damascus when Saul of Tarsus had gotten saved on the road leading to Damascus? Uh, and God appeared to uh, Ananias. And he told him to go down to a particular house on a particular street, straight street I think it was, and, and he was to lay his hands on Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias was a little bit reluctant. He wasn't too sure he wanted to do what God wanted him to do. He wasn't too sure he wanted to go meet Saul of Tarsus. He'd heard about Saul of Tarsus. He heard that Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus to uh, uh, imprison all the Christians that he could find, and that included Ananias. And Ananias is thinking, you want me to go see him? You want me to turn myself into him? You want him to arrest me and put me in jail? And so he was a little bit reluctant to go. But God assured him that God, he did want him to go and meet with Saul of Tarsus. And he said, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So even before Saul of Tarsus came to know Christ as Savior, before the foundations of the world were laid, God had already chosen him by his grace for a particular ministry that he had no idea that God was going to use him to accomplish. You have no idea what God wants to do with your life. Whether you're young or old, whether you're middle-aged, whether you're just a student here, you have no idea what God wants to do with your life. And Saul of Tarsus was a chosen vessel unto God. He had been called by God to that particular ministry that he didn't even know existed at that particular time. Some years later, he was writing to his young uh, follower, to young uh, Timothy, his protege. And, and he wrote about uh, that time in his life when God called him and put him into the ministry. And, and there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and in verse 12, he said, I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I think it was Spurgeon who told his young uh, students in his Bible college there in London, young men, if you can do anything else in, in life and be happy doing it, if you can be a businessman, if you can be a shipmaster, if you can be a shoemaker, and you can do that and you can be happy doing that, then go do it. But if God's called you 
and you can't do anything other than preach the gospel, then go preach the gospel. And Saul of Tarsus, though he had his own plans of what he wanted to do with his life, God had different plans and had chosen him and set him apart and put him into the ministry. And it was by the grace of God that he did that. I was a senior in high school and God spoke to my heart about going to the Bible college. And I can remember that first year in Bible college. We had to take a course in missions. Now, in all honesty, I did not want to be a missionary. All right, The last thing in the world I wanted to be was a missionary. I thought if I could be an evangelist and travel the world and preach the gospel to people and, and lead people to Christ, that would be wonderful. Being a pastor would be a great thing to do, but a missionary, that was absolutely on the bottom of my list. No, and uh, God, God in his grace and mercy would never call me to that. But we had to take a course in missions. And uh, we had a lady uh, teacher. And she sat on a raised platform, something like this, behind a desk. And she had one of these missionary hairdos, these missionary buns, you know what I'm talking about, tied up on the back of her head, little round thing on the back of her head. Uh, and she was about 625 years old, I think. Of course, I was only 18, 19 at the time, and anybody over 30 looked that old to me. But uh, I, I can remember I was not interested. She had this big, thick book that gave the population of every country how many cows, how many sheep, how many camels there were, how much uh, uh, cotton they grew and how much rice they grew and so on and so forth. And she read that book to us in a monotone voice. That was our course in missions. You knew if you came out of that class wanting to be a missionary, God had called you. <laughs> but uh, back in those days when I went to Bible college, uh, it was a little bit different going to Bible college. I, I, I checked with my granddaughter tonight. Uh, I said, Hartland, tell me about Hartland. Uh, and Heartland is nothing like the Bible school I went to. Uh, back in those days, all the guys sat on one side of the classroom, all the girls on the other side of the classroom, same way in the dining hall, same way in chapel, uh, and, and there was always this big wide aisle uh, dividing the classrooms, the chapels, the dining hall, and everything. And woe be to the guy that ever crossed that aisle. It was called the Jordan River. <laughs> and, and we used to sit over on our side of the aisle not paying attention particularly to the teacher because we weren't interested, we weren't going to be a missionary. And we'd look across Jordan into the promised land <laughs> and dream of the day when we would cross Jordan. And one day the, uh, the teacher gave an assignment. The only thing I can ever remember from her class other than that boring book was that you had to go to the library, get a book, and read it and write a book report on it. And I, I, uh, when the class was over, I came out of that place like I shot out of a gun. I wanted to get to the library. I couldn't wait to get to the library. I had to be the first guy to the library. You see, if you are smart in college and you're the first one in line, you get the smallest book with the largest print and the most pictures in it. And I, I picked up a book written by some lady I had never heard of. Her name was Elizabeth Elliot, and it was a book called uh, Through Gates of Splendor. Some of you may recognize that book. It's the story of Jim Elliot, her husband, and the five missionaries that were murdered by the Alca Indians in Ecuador back in the 1950s. And I took that book back to, my, back to my dorm room and I made a huge mistake. I opened it and I began to read it and God was hiding inside the covers of that book and he jumped out of that book, grabbed me by the heart and I, he said, I want you to become a missionary. And I said, oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to do that. I'll do anything else, but not a missionary, not that. And God and I entered into a, a battle royal that lasted for weeks and weeks and weeks until I finally came to that place where I knelt beside my bed. I said, all right, Lord, if that's what you want, that's what I'll do. You know, that was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. I look back at it now, it was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. But you know, that was by the grace of God. It wasn't what I had planned, but that's what God had planned. It's by God's grace that he calls us and he puts us into, into ministry. But that, that's not all. You also find that God, by his grace, uh, enables us to serve him. We're called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. When God saved us, he saved us by his grace. He called us. He puts us into ministry. And then he enables us to, to carry on ministry. I was just a farm boy. Uh, I am perfectly content to, you stick me in a little cubicle uh, with a book, with a piece of paper, with a computer, and I am just as happy as can be. The last place I want to be is up here, all right? I, I don't like being up here. You give me a job, I'm behind the scene type guy. I want to be a CPA, a certified public accountant. 
uh, when I was in high school. I was ready to go to school and made application to go to Drake University and, and to study to become a CPA. Uh, and uh, that's what I wanted to do. But God had other, other, other ideas. He wanted me to serve him. And, and he called me and put me into the ministry. My Bible says that we are created unto Jesus Christ, unto good works. God has a job for each one of us to do. He had a job for me to do. It was different than what I wanted. And God, by his grace, he enables us to do what he calls us to do. He gives us gifts of his grace. Back in the book of Romans, chapter 12, Paul gives a list of, I think it's six or eight different spiritual gifts that he gives to us there. And the word that is used there is the word charismaton. Uh, it, it's, the, it's a word that describes a, 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 a gift of grace that is given unto the hearers. And God gives different gift, uh, grace gifts unto each one of us. Uh, he talks about one being called to, uh, to, to prophesy, to preach, another one to be a teacher, another one to be a, a, a giver of financial resources and various things. But God, by his grace, enables us to see a need. He enables us to meet that need. He enables us to, to carry out the ministry that he calls us to. I never dreamed that I would be able to do the things that I've been able to do. I never dreamed that I'd have the opportunity to do the things that I've been, uh, had the opportunity to do. But God, in his grace, he does that. You may be sitting there tonight thinking, God could never use me. Oh, yes, he could. He will enable you to do whatever he calls you to do. God's grace is always sufficient to accomplish whatever he wants you to accomplish. None of us is special. It's only by God's grace that we have the talents and the skills and the abilities and the opportunities to do what he wants us to do. He equips each person for different types of ministry. He gives us different insights. He gives us different uh, skills. He give, gives us different abilities that he wants us to use. Our job is to be responsive to God, to, do the thing, uh, to, to simply make ourselves available to him and say, Lord, here I am. Take me and use me however you want. And so you find that it's by the grace of God that we are called to serve him. There's a second thing that I want you to notice tonight. Not only are, uh, is it the grace of God that enables us and calls us to, to serve him, but you find that grace also involves a commitment to share. The grace of God involves a commitment to share. Missions is a team effort. Uh, Sometimes uh, we, we take missionaries and put them up on a pedestal and we think that they, they're out there, look at those marvelous missionaries, look at what they're accomplishing. But what we don't see oftentimes is that there's a whole bunch of other people involved behind the scenes that make it possible for them to accomplish what they, they accomplish. Uh, and, and God is at work. Missions is a team ministry. Uh, it takes a lot of different people doing a lot of different things in order to put a missionary on the field and to keep them there and to enable them to be able to do what they're doing. First of all, God has to choose them and has to call them that ministry. If God doesn't choose them, they're not going to be very successful. Even if the person says, I want to be a missionary. If God hasn't called you to that ministry, you're not going to be very good at it. God has to take and call that person and put them into ministry. Somebody has to take and equip them, to teach them, to train them. Usually it's going to be a, a pastor or a teachers in a Bible college that are going to teach the missionary uh, the things that he needs to know, provide him with the skills that he needs to have in order to carry out the ministry that he, he uh, is going to have in the future. Somebody uh, is going to have to say, hey, we will help you to get to the field. Usually that's going to be a, a mission agency or maybe a local church that commissions that missionary and sends that missionary out and, and, and stands behind that missionary. But somebody has to do that. Uh, churches are needed. Uh, multiple churches are needed in order to finance that missionary's uh, finances on the field, in order to provide the money, in order to get to the field, to live on the field, to be able to carry on that ministry, to build the buildings and to build the churches that they need. So, so there's a whole host of people that are used Dozens of people, hundreds of people that are involved in putting a missionary on the field, keeping them there for a long time. The Apostle Paul recognized that his ministry was a team ministry. Almost all the time that Paul was on the mission field, he had other people that were working alongside of him, people that were, were running errands, people that he could send to, to troubled spots. Uh, I think of Timothy. Wherever there was a problem, he'd send Timothy to solve the problem. I, I think of some of the other guys, to Titus and Silas and, and uh, Barnabas and other people that worked alongside of him. Uh, 
you know, the Apostle Paul talked about the fact that he planted. Uh, Apollos had, had taken and watered. God had uh, given the increase, and he recognized that, that team ministry. And, and down through the years, we've uh, been privileged to, to experience that type of team ministry as well. Uh, God in his grace has raised up multiple churches and hundreds of people like you folks that have sacrificed and have helped and have prayed and have participated in order to put us on the field for, for over half of a century. Uh, I, I mentioned that I, I wanted to be a CPA, and, and I never got to be a CPA. But over the last 50-plus years, every field that I've served on, while I've been on those fields, I've been the treasurer of whatever was there. Now, whether it was the Bible college when I was at, working at the Bible college in the, in the, uh, the islands or whether it was uh, in South America working on the field, uh, I, I was the treasurer there. Uh, in North America, I've been treasurer I don't know how many years uh, uh, in, in North America here for our missionaries in North America in a, a variety of different areas. And, and God has, has blessed in that area. He, he's allowed me to do what I wanted to do without all the training that I should have had, I wish I'd had along the years. But the result of that is that I tend to keep a lot of facts and figures and lots of papers and lots of records and, and I tend to be a detailed person. And so recently I went back and I actually have a list of every church I've ever spoken in. And I began to count up how many different churches uh, that we've been in. Not how many times I've been to Cornerstone. Cornerstone counts one time, all right? Regardless of how many times I've been here. But over the years, we've been in some 320 different churches to present our ministry. Of those 320 churches, 42 of them at one time or another took us on for support. Some of those churches are no longer in existence. They've died. They've gone out of existence. Some of them have changed their, uh, their mission policy or their doctrinal statements, and they've gone off into left field. Uh, some of them have changed pastors, and sometimes when churches change pastors, they change missionaries right, right along with them. Uh, but of those 42 churches that took us on for support, 22 of them still support us today. And I went back, and I actually have every financial statement Baptist Men Missions has sent to me over the last 52 years. And I just put it on Excel. wonder what this comes out to be. And, and what I found was, of those 22 churches, nine of them have supported us for 50 years or more. Six of them have supported us for 40 years or more, uh, and three of them have supported us for 30 years or more. Out of the 22 churches, 18 of the 22 have supported us for 30 years or more. Now, that's faithfulness. That's teamwork. Uh, that's what it takes in order to put somebody on the field and keep them there for a generation. It's teamwork that does that. It's God's people working together. This church has supported us for how long? Anybody know? I do. For the last six years, we're, you're one of our, our more recent churches that have taken us on for support. The last six years, you've given over $6,000 to our ministry in just the last six years. And, and we wanted to come tonight to say to you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity, for your faith, for your confidence. Uh, and your encouragement to us over these last several years. It's a joy to be able to come out here, and, and we get the bonus of seeing the kids and the grandkids when we come to your church. Uh, we get to visit your church more than any other church uh, for some reason. And, and so we just wanted to come and say thank you. But it's, it's, a, it's a testimony to God's grace and to God's faithfulness that God has raised up churches and people like you that have been a part of our ministry over all these years. So the grace of God involves a call to serve. Uh, the grace of God uh, involves a call to share. But the grace of God also uh, involves a conclusion to which we have to agree. Um, we, we have the opportunity of going into New York City uh, several times a year, working with a church in the Bronx, only a few blocks from Yankee Stadium. And I, I, I've learned that when you go to New York City, there are some things that you don't do. You don't go out after dark, particularly, in that part of the city, all right? It, it's just not a safe place to be out after dark. It's hardly a safe place to be out during the daytime. But uh, I've also learned you never want to say anything bad about the New York Yankees. Regardless of what you think of them, you always want to find something good to say about the New York Yankees. Now, you can say all the bad things you want ab about the Mets, uh, nobody cares about the Mets there, they, except they love to hate them. But uh, the Yankees, you've got to say something good about them. Well, there was a certain ca baseball catcher by the name of Yogi Berra. 
uh, the most famous uh, Yankee catcher there was. And Yogi Berra had his own particular way of talking. It always seemed to come out strangely. And one of the things that Yogi Berra once said is that it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till it's over. Uh, and, and that's true in baseball. But you know, in reality, everything comes to an end eventually. Even baseball games do. They, they come to an end eventually. And the Apostle Paul was the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. Uh, God used him in a marvelous way to plant uh, dozens and dozens of churches. And one day he was sitting in a Roman prison cell and he picked up his quill pen and he penned these words. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He realized that his life was coming to an end. Uh, he had been condemned to die and the executioner would be coming any day, perhaps any hour uh, to take him out and to sever his head from his body. Uh, God had used him in a marvelous way as a missionary as a church planner, as a theologian, as a writer of scripture, uh, a preacher, a trainer, all kinds of things. And, and one of the most productive mis missionaries ever to walk upon the face of the earth. And yet his ministry came to an end. It came to an end. Uh, he had done all that he could do. And he carried out the task that God had assigned to him. Uh, and uh, his, his time on earth was coming to a close when he wouldn't be able to do the things he'd done before. You know, a couple of years ago, Baptist Missions, the mission agency that we serve with, did something that I didn't like. They adopted a mandatory uh, policy that requires you to step down from active ministry when you reach a certain age. Now, I am only halfway to that certain age. All right? So I, I'm glad for that. I am only 37, and, uh, 37 years old. All right, and so I've got a long ways to go before I reach their mandatory retirement age. The only problem with that is they happen to know what my birthday is. And my birth certificate says that in January, I'm going to hit that, that particular goal that they have in mind. When you turn 75, uh, you have to step down from active ministry. And I keep telling them, I am only 37 years old. And for some reason, they will not believe that. Uh, but uh, the reality is that uh, in, at the end of this year, uh, they are going to transfer us from being active missionaries to be emeritus missionaries. Now, doesn't that sound wonderful? I mean, that sounds like a promotion from active to emeritus. That's like being, uh, going from a, a busboy in the restaurant to being the owner of the restaurant, sounds like unless you know what it means, all right? But they, they, they've been very gracious to us, uh, and uh, we will still be missionaries with them after December 31st. It happens on December 31st that that transition is going to take place at the end of this year. Uh, but uh, they are being very gracious to us and giving us that designation. Uh, we will still be missionaries with them. We will still be serving with them. Uh, we will be still involved in a number of areas of ministry. Pace will change a little bit. We won't be running from one end of the country to the other quite as often as what we now do. Uh, we'll still be doing some of that, but not as, not as much. We'll still be engaged in our ministries of teaching and writing and, and training other, other folks and counseling ministries with missionaries around the country. We'll be doing some of that, not as much as what we now do. But uh, we'll still be directing and co-teaching our school of church planning, hopefully for the next 20 years or so. Uh, we'll still be involved in that. We have one coming up here in June, just about in three and a half weeks. We will be in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, teaching our School of Church Planning for the 31st time. And we have, uh, we have about 50% more uh, students, pastors, missionaries coming from around the world than what we had last year. And so we're looking forward to that very, very much. But they're going to allow us to continue to direct that and, and teach that in the future. I'll still be editing their Church Planners toolbox that goes all over the world. Also, I'll be editing their North American Focus uh, uh, fact sheet that goes out to Bible colleges all across America. We'll still be doing uh, that while we're there. Still be going into New York City and, and working with the church there in the New York City. Still be uh, working with our church planners in Boston and uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, brand new church getting started uh, in Cambridge. Uh, it's in the early stages. It's only about three months old. Haven't even begun having public services, just beginning to build the, the core group now. And, and we'll be very much involved in that in the future uh, as well. 
Uh, they're going to allow us to still fill in with, for other missionaries. You know, when a missionary goes on furlough here in America, it's not like it is overseas. Overseas, you, you fly back to America, and you don't have to worry about your, your ministry. The other missionaries fill in, uh, and your ministry is there when you get back. But what do you do if you're a missionary here in North America? Well, you invite us. And we move into your house, we sleep in your bed, we eat the food that you leave for us in your refrigerator, we take over your church, and we try not to fly it into the ground while you're gone. And they're going to allow us to continue to do that as well. And we'll still be able to help facilitate our, our biennial field conferences out in Iowa and things of that sort. I think all in all, there's some nine different areas of ministry that they're still going to allow us to continue carrying on even though our status changes from active to emeritus, and I hate to use that word, it's supposed to be retired, but uh, we're not retiring, all right? Uh, they, they've actually voted, both of the field councils in North America have voted to keep us uh, actively involved in their ministry uh, levels there. I'll still be making overseas teaching trips. Our next trip is coming up here in the first week of August. I'll be in Managua, Nicaragua, and we'll be teaching a, a, a 40-hour course in five days. Uh, I'll have the, about 40 pastors from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock at night, uh, teaching them a course in anthropology, harmatiology, and soteriology. Now, doesn't that sound impressive? Uh, sure is. You know, those are 50 cent theological words. Simply means I'm going to be teaching about man, sin, and salvation is what it's going to be. But it's the heart of the theological course. And, and uh, be back uh, there uh, in the future, maybe making as many as two to three trips a year uh, there to uh, teach and to train pastors on, on the foreign field. Uh, and so we're just uh, thrilled with what God has done and the opportunities that God gives us. But uh, one, one of the things that we're asking our churches to do is uh, to maintain that support through the end of the year while we're still as active missionaries and be running from one end of the country to the other. But even after that, we're asking our churches to pray uh, and uh, we covet your prayers in the future, but we're asking our churches pray about the possibility of continuing some of that support, maybe not all of it, but some of that support after we uh, step down from uh, the status that we're in uh, to a less active status that we'll be in. Come along about uh, November. Pastor, you're going to get a letter. Matter of fact, you're going to get two letters, uh, one from me and one from our mission agency telling you what I told you tonight, uh, that we're going to be stepping down at the end of the year. And their letter will also have a, a recommended uh, budget in it, a uh, recommended support level that they'll recommend to you. And you can do with that whatever you want to do. But uh, we're, we're hopeful that God will lay upon the hearts of our supporting churches to continue that, a lot of that support so that we can continue to carry on the ministries that God has given to us over the years uh, on into the future for a number of times, uh, uh, not a number of times, but uh, a number of years uh, in, in the future. Uh, God's been so good to us. We do not deserve to have churches like this church uh, supporting us and people like you praying for us and standing behind us and encouraging us. God has been so good to us. It's not because of who we are. It's because of who God is. And it's by God's grace that we have been able to accomplish and have been privileged to serve for, for the many years that we've been able to serve. You know, the greatest gift in life is the uh, gift of salvation. To be a child of God, to have our sins to, forgiven, to have a home in heaven. There is no greater privilege than that. Uh, but the, 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 that's the greatest gift. But the, there's another one that goes right along uh, with it, very closely with it. And that is the, the, the privilege of being a servant of Jesus Christ. Do you know that in the kingdom of God, the highest designation that you can receive is that of a servant. Remember the parable of the talents. And the Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the highest designation. And, and to have had the privilege for more than 50 years to be able to be involved in ministry as a missionary and, and to be a servant of Jesus Christ, that's a tremendous privilege and honor that nobody deserves. It's only by the grace of God that you have that opportunity. And so we wanted to come tonight especially, and Pastor was very gracious to allow us to come on this weekend when we were going to be in town anyway to, to speak to you this evening. I appreciate that so very much. But we wanted to come back and just say thank you to you as a congregation for being a part of our ministry for these years. Hopefully we can continue to be a part of that uh, in the future. And as I look back over the, over the years and all that God has done by his grace, I feel a little bit like the man in... Luke chapter 17, 
uh, who was out in the field working all day, plowing, uh, planting, uh, reaping, uh, carrying on the work. And when he gets done at the end of the day, he comes in and the master says, prepare my supper. And, and so without griping, he, he prepares the supper. And somebody asks him, D don't you resent that? And his answer was simply, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. And that's how we feel about our ministry. We are unprofitable servants. We have simply done that which is our duty to do. And like the Apostle Paul, uh, I, I feel that I am the least of all missionaries. Uh, and I'm not worthy to be uh, honored uh, the way that uh, the mission honors us and some of our fellow missionaries honor us. But it's by the grace of God that I am what I am. And, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. I have labored abundantly. Uh, yet not I, but the grace of God that was abundant unto me. Thank you so very much for allowing us to be a part of your congregation. Thank you for taking our kids in and our grandkids in and being a good church for them. And I, I appreciate the music that you have here and, and the ministry that you have here. And I appreciate you being a part of our ministry and allowing us to be part of your ministry. And again, we simply want to say to you tonight, thank you. It's all by the grace of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity to be here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I thank you so much for Pastor Mitchell and for the many others that are faithful in carrying on the ministry here. Thank you for the mission vision that they have of reaching out around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I would simply pray, dear God, that you might work in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, young people, uh, students in their school, and that you would call from this congregation a number of folks into the harvest field, not only here in Indiana, but around the world. Accomplish your purpose in their life. We thank you for your grace. We pray that you'd continue to extend it to us every single day. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Let's stand together and open our hymn books to page 41. Page 41, God is so good. Good to get a good report from our missionary. I really appreciate the, the ministry, the work that he's done, and his faithfulness. It's a long time to serve and be faithful. And so we're thankful. But you can't do that without a good God. You can't do that without the grace of God. And so we're thankful for that. Tonight, maybe the Lord would speak to you about something you could do. Maybe he'd call you into the ministry. Whatever God calls you, whatever he says, whatever he leads you to do, that's going to be the most successful place you can be in life. The only place you can find real joy and real peace is in God's will. So as we sing tonight, page 41, God is so good. God speaks to your heart. Here's a place to come.
being with us tonight. We ask Brother and Sister McLemore to come stand with us in the foyer, and uh, you come by and let them know that you appreciate them, their ministry, and uh, excited about what God's going to do, even though there's some changes. God's still in control. Amen? So uh, we'll, at this time, be dismissed in prayer, and uh, we'll see you Wednesday night. Amen? All right. Mr. Tatnan, would you dismiss us in prayer? We'll let your dad do it if he wants. <laughs> Okay, I got a Mr. Tatman one, one way or the other, didn't I?